choices. Every day, we make hundreds of choices. Will we get out of bed or will we hit the snooze button? Will we start the day focusing on the eternal or will we get lost in the immediacy of the news of the day? Will we exercise or make a different choice? How will we treat our colleagues and our customers? Will we treat them with kindness and empathy or will we choose to be impatient and selfish? When it's time for lunch, will we choose healthy or will we choose something less healthy? When our workday is finished, will we choose to go for a walk or will instead we choose to stroll on social media? Will we put down our phones to engage with those who matter most when the day is over or will we continue to scroll and wonder why our relationships are less than fulfilling, less than they could otherwise be? You see, our choices become our habits, and our habits become our lifestyle, and our lifestyle becomes our life story. Today we'll be focusing on our habits, the repeated choices we've made so frequently that we no longer know we're even making them. We'll examine the cues that spark our choices and begin the process of making better choices, creating better habits, a better lifestyle, and the best life story. Best is waiting. Meet you there. Charles Duhigg, welcome to Personal and Professional Best. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, we're really excited to have you. Charles, our program is all about people being intentional in life so that they can live their very best life. What we know is true in America is that we all share six categories of life, family, relationships, health and fitness, personal finance, fun and recreation, faith and or community service, and business. And everybody answers the question, of course, I want to be my best personally and professionally, but sadly, most are living at some place below best. And the program was built to encourage, inspire and educate, which is what we intend to do with you today. And I'm so excited because in the month of January, we had all of the folks in our program lay out their goals in writing specifically in those categories for the year. And as I thought about it, I thought, wow, step one's in place. They know where they want to go to become the best version of themselves. If only we would find a way for them to change the way they behave so they could actually get there. And I thought, if we could have somebody, an expert, come talk to us about how to make change to their habits, we might just be onto something. So welcome because Thank we have you. one of the world's experts on the topic of habits. So, so much. you wrote the book. I mean, you're I the wrote, expert. You that's know, right. I so wrote a book um, called the power of habit. It's all about the science of how habits exist within our brains and how we change them, and um, and hopefully become better versions of ourselves. Right, and I that's what I really want us to do is to, is to give our people the gift today to understand so they don't feel as bad about themselves about where they're at. And then they have tools in the toolbox to actually use starting tomorrow so they can get where you've already told us that we can get to. So let's get to work if, you, um, okay. if you're if ready. Okay. So what motivated you, first of all, to write the book, The Power well, of Habits? I had these two experiences. Um, the first was, you know, my, um, my, my son, my first son, my oldest son had just been born. And so me and my wife were kind of thinking a lot about habits. And, and I was at that stage in life that I'm sure many of the people watching this were at where I was thinking to myself, you know, like, I feel like I'm a pretty accomplished person, right? Like I, I went to college, I got an MBA. I, at that point, I was a reporter at the New York Times. And, and I felt like I was like pretty smart. I kind of knew what was going on. 
And yet for the life of me, I could not make myself get up in the morning to run or exercise. And I would sit down and I would tell myself, I'm going to eat healthy today. And I'd sit down and I was exhausted and I'd order like a beer and a burger like I did every other day. And I was just thinking to myself, like, if I'm so smart, why is it so hard to change these habits? Like, like what's actually going on inside my brain? And then I had this experience where um, I was a war correspondent for a little while and I went to Iraq. And this is in 2003 and 2004, right when the, the U.S. was moving in. And I got embedded with this, this, um, this regiment and, and I talked to this one army major. And this guy, I was, I was asking him, like, how to, sort of how does stuff work? And he says, well, you know, what's interesting about the army is that the army is a habit change machine. Like when you're, when you're first, you know, a newbie, if someone's shooting at you, your reaction is to run away. Not to Go the other you. way. Exactly. Exactly. That's natural, right? And yet the army has to teach you this habit to shoot back, to, to risk yourself. And, or, or, you know, nowadays, because communications are so good, you can be in Kufa, uh, Iraq, which is where I was embedded with them. And you can email with your spouse every single night. You can do video phone calls. And so if you don't know good communication habits, you get into a fight, right? And then you're distracted the next day when you're on patrol. And so the army exists, all militaries exist, to understand how to change people's habits. And this guy I was talking to, he's about, he's about five foot three. He's an army major. He um, said that when he graduated from high school, he was trying to decide whether to go into the military or whether to join his brother, who had just become a very successful methamphetamine entrepreneur. And his brother gets abducted <laughs> the night before graduation. So he enters the military list and he ends up being a major, right? Which is like a really high rank. And this guy tells me, if it hadn't been for the army and teaching me habits, I wouldn't have known how to do anything. He says, I use it with my family. I use it with my kids. I use it with my troops. Like this is a way for understanding sort of the, the mechanics of gears of life. And once he told me that, when I came home, I thought, I got to learn about this stuff. So that's, that's how I got interested. Wow, that's an amazing story. You can't even make that kind of story up, right? And so, uh, so it's, a, it's great. And I'm glad that you did this because I think this is one of those things when you talk to people, you go, yeah, habit. Yeah, creatures of habit. And everyone just quickly says, yeah, I understand that and passes right by it. But there's a lot more to it. And that's, that's what right. I want me and you now to get down to business. What is, in the simplest of terms, what is a habit? Well, it's a great question, and and it's it's a little bit more complicated to do that. Let me let me tell you a quick story. I actually put together some slides for this. So there was this woman named Dr. Ann Grabeel, who's a researcher at MIT, and about twenty years ago, she decided to start doing experiments with rats. and And her first goal was to get sensors into a rat's cranium, so she could kind of measure what was happening inside their brain as they went about their daily business. And it took her a little while to figure out how to do this, but eventually, she got where she could get about 17 sensors inside a rat's brain and observe its neural activity. And what she would do is she would put every single rat in this, the world's simplest maze. Now this maze works the same way every single time. There's a click, that partition there would move, and then the rat's free to run up and down the maze looking for the chocolate. Now, the first time you drop a rat in a maze like this, it takes it about 20 minutes to find that chocolate. And that seems like a kind of oddly long time. And so Dr. Grabeel was kind of curious, like maybe the rat's just lazy or it's not thinking very hard, but she was able to see what's going on inside the rat's brain. This, this, this graph you see right here, that's, the, that's a, a simplified neurological graph of the first time that a rat runs through a maze like this. And you see all those spikes in the graph? That's the rat trying to make sense of what's going on. So the click, the partition moves and the rat starts scratching the walls and the mortar vehicle parts of its brain light up with activity. And then it sniffs the air and the olfactory senses start becoming active inside its brain. And then it starts running up and down. And eventually after about 20 minutes, it finds that chocolate and there's this reward sensation inside the rat's brain. And this is a big finding. Dr. Graville publishes this, but then she does something interesting. She takes each rat and she drops it in the maze again and again and again. And unsurprisingly, over time, the rat gets faster and faster and faster finding the chocolate, right? Click, the partition moves, the rat starts making a beeline to the chocolate. What's really interesting though, is that as the rat gets faster and faster and faster, it starts thinking less and less and less. In fact, if you look at this graph on the, on the right, what you'll see is a simplified neurological graph of about the, the 50th iteration through that maze. And that deep valley 
in cognitive cognitive thinking, that's the same drop off you would see if the rat was falling asleep. What we know is that as you get into the pattern of doing something over and over and over again, as it becomes a habit, we start thinking about it less and less and less. And this is actually really useful for our brain because our brain wants to conserve mental energy whenever it can. In fact, there's a part of our brain known as the basal ganglia that exists just to make habits. Because without that, we would have never evolved into people who can invent fire or video games or anything else. But what's interesting about this drop-off is that it follows kind of a formula. And it's known as the habit loop. If you look for a second at the beginning of that maze, you see that click? There's this burst of neurological activity, right? And then a drop-off as the rat runs through the maze. And then when it finds the chocolate at the end of the maze, it starts thinking hard again. It's as if its brain starts to shake itself to pay attention to what's going on. This is the neurological signature of a habit. Every single habit in your life, and there 40 to 45% of what you do every day is a habit. Every habit inside your life, if I could look inside your brain, I would see this. And what it tells us is this. Every habit has three parts. There's a cue, which is like that click, something that triggers an automatic behavior. And then there's the routine, the behavior itself, what we think of as the habit. And then at the end of that, there is a reward. You might notice it, you might not, but your brain notices it. And it takes that cue, routine, and that reward, and it chunks them together, and it makes a habit inside your brain that makes it easier and easier and easier to do whatever you're thinking of. So, so a little bit like we wake up in the morning, we go into the bathroom, and then we brush our teeth. Right. That, so that we don't think about doing that. Now, maybe when we were young, our parents told us to do it. But once you start doing it over and over again, it just becomes one of those things that you just do. And we live, you said, 40 to 50 percent of our lives in that way. Absolutely. Every single day, 40 to 45 percent, about half of what you do. And what's it's fascinating you bring up the, the, the teeth brushing example, because one of the things that we found and everyone, anyone who has kids, you know, this it's like pulling teeth to get them to brush their teeth, right? It's like, it's like the hardest thing on earth. And yet, if you're like me, I come out of the shower, if I don't have that minty feeling inside my mouth, I don't- The reward. It. Right, exactly. Is that teeth brushing only became a habit when they started using mint and toothpaste so that you mm. have this physical sensation. That sensation inside your mouth, that's actually the reward. You start Got to associate it. that. Your brain starts to associate that with a sense of cleanliness. Leave it to America to learn how to sell something, right? Exactly. We need to sell more toothpaste. We got to get more young kids to brush their teeth more often. So give them a reward. Chocolate, no. Let's give them mint with their That's toothpaste. Exactly. I love it. So, <laughs> so 50% of our lives, um, 40 to 50% of our lives are habits. What comes naturally to a human being from a habit formation, good habits or bad habits? Actually, both of them, right? Because your brain doesn't distinguish between good habits and bad habits. It just creates habits anytime there's a reward. And so it's up to you to decide which are good habits and which are bad habits. And, and let's take exercise as an example of this, right? Because exercise is one of the most studied things. It's something we all want to do more of. So there was a big experiment that was done in Germany where they took about a thousand people and they told them, look, you, you all need to exercise more. They gave them a 45 minute lecture about the importance of exercise. And then they took a smaller group, about 300 of them off into another room. And they said, okay, here's what we wanna do. Just 10 minute exercise. We want you to choose a cue for exercise, right? If you're gonna go running on, on Wednesday, just decide right now you're gonna put your shoes next to your bed so you see them when you wake up in the morning. Or maybe you're gonna go to the gym that day. And so you schedule with Bob, your friend, that you're gonna meet him at six o'clock. And then go into your exercise. And we want you to do this. As soon as you exercise, give yourself a small piece of chocolate. Now, most of us, we like go and we exercise. And then we wait like an hour before we eat chocolate because we're pretending like they're not related to each other, right? <laughs> but what the German scientists figured is like, look, if we can convince you to give yourself a piece of chocolate right away, if we can give you convince yourself to give yourself a reward, it's going to get easier and easier to do this. The cue and the reward are going to get linked. And that's what they found. Nine months later, they tracked down everyone in that room. They find that all the people who just heard the 45 minute lecture, not many of them are exercising, but the people who had gotten that additional small little lecture, 29% of them are exercising. 
And the reason why is I said, you know, at first I was just looking forward to that chocolate. And then, and then after a little while, I stopped eating the chocolate because I just realized I feel so good when I exercise. I get this endorphin rush, right? And that's how habits work. There is no such thing as a good habit or a bad habit. There are just habits. But we get to decide which habits we want and which ones we don't want. And the way that we choose that, the way that we create habits in our life, is we decide which cues and rewards to link to a behavior to make it easier and easier. You know, we talked about brushing teeth. Of course, I'm a parent. I have two um, adult children now, boys. And, you know, as parents, you, you do invest yourselves in attempting to teach the habit of treating people well, of eating well, of the value of a dollar, all of our program, if you will. But when people then get to be adults, they get to make their own decisions in life, right? And and so it's just really important that we start with the playbook for our children and they get a little bit older. And for anybody out there who doesn't think that habits, this conversation is absolutely real. If you're like me, I'm married, go home tonight and, and get in the other side of the bed. When I say the other side of the bed, we all sleep on a side of the bed, right? And how that got decision got made, um, when it got made, I, I forget. I've been married 37 years, but I do know this. If I went home tonight and got in the other side of the bed, it would cause an event, right? Oh, a yeah. change, right? Right. It, it wouldn't change the bed. It wouldn't change how long we slept for, but it would be a significant and really interesting and uncomfortable yeah, event to take place. I won't do that, that by the way. Both of you guys would sleep less well. It's interesting, <laughs> right? We get into it. It is interesting. Life. So, you know, um, if we want to get um, to to really get to know this conversation in the truest term for our own lives, should we document our life over the next week and just and just kind of make notes of our own habits, the things that we're not really choosing that we just naturally do? What do you think about that? Absolutely. That's a great way of doing it, right? To, to sort of observe yourself. And this is the best, the biggest lesson and the lesson we can teach our kids is when you learn to recognize the cues and the rewards in your life, that's when you gain power over the habits that influence you. So let's, let's take exercise again, right? Think for a minute how most people start exercising, right? We know that we should give ourselves a reward after we exercise. But most people, they're like, okay, I'm going to go for a run tomorrow. They wake up, they put on their running stuff. They, they have to search it out of the closet, you know, pull it out. They don't know where it is. And then they're like, I don't know where to run. So they go and they go for a run, a couple of blocks, they come back. Now they're running late, right? So they like rush through a shower. And now the kids are late for school. So you like throw the kids in the car and you like rush to school to drop them off. Now, and then you rush to your desk and you're 15 minutes late for work and you're like sweating and you're like, in other words, you have punished yourself for exercising that morning. And your brain, your brain pays attention to rewards and punishments. Your Let's not that, do that again. <laughs> yeah, this is a terrible idea. I'm not going to make it easier to go running. Now take the alternative, right? You say, okay, tomorrow I'm going to go running. So I'm going to put all my running stuff right next to the bed so I can put it on no problem. I'm going to choose my route ahead of time. I'm going to set my alarm for 10 minutes earlier. Even better, I'm going to ask my husband to take the kids to school so that I don't have to do it tomorrow. Now you go and you take a run, you come home, you take a nice shower, you have a smoothie, you have some chocolate if you want to. Now your brain's like, this running stuff is great. This is how we document our life, whether it's on a piece of paper or whether it's just noticing the stuff. This is how we learn to control our own habits is just by paying attention to those cues and those rewards. Yeah. So, you know, as you're talking, I'm sitting here thinking that the cliche creature of habit, it's so true, right? For all of our lives. And what's important if we want to become our best is that we just step back and really watch a film of our life and then decide, and we're going to get to a minute about how to, let's just say, change habits, right? Um, the ones that we have, replacing them with better ones. But it's so true. I'll tell you a quick story. In the last 24 hours, I had a weigh-in with my, my trainer and he texts me literally every other morning How'd you weigh in this morning? How did you weigh in this morning? He's my accountability partner. I told him if I didn't get to my target, I would fire him. So <laughs> he's got additional motivation. But uh, uh, yesterday morning in the office here, um, I grew up in South Florida. I love bagels. That's not on my dietary, though, preferences, especially with my trainers. So 
Yesterday morning, I walk in to get a cup of coffee in the break room, and there's a beautiful, I mean, beautiful, beautiful tray of bagels. And, and the cream cheese is there, and it looks just absolutely the cue. There they are, right? right? And had that been broccoli and some carrots and some other things or fruit in the morning, you know, I would have been delighted to go back in for my second cup of coffee. But as it was, I was going back for a second cup of coffee. And I was like, I don't want to go back in there. The bagels are there. And I know that I'm likely to bend, but I did because I have willpower on this topic. Let's shift. Um, in the book, you talk about willpower. Why don't we just simply identify something that's in our life habit wise that needs changing why don't we just change it right why not why can't we use that why, why can't we just white knuckle it right why can't we use that willpower so here's what's really interesting is willpower is real right we have willpower but willpower is like a muscle it can get stronger the more you exercise it and that's why it's good to use willpower if you can at least once a day to keep that muscle toned but it also gets tired. Even the strongest bodybuilders, if they sit down and they pump 500 pounds, then they are exhausted afterwards. Their muscles are more tired. And your willpower muscle is a muscle that gets tired throughout a day. So it might be easy to go for a run in the morning, but then you get home from work at five o'clock and you've spent the whole day doing boring or hard stuff and you just don't wanna go back out, right? You don't wanna put on those sneakers because your willpower muscle is tired. So that raises the question, what should we do instead? How do we strengthen the willpower in our life? How do we make it, make it easier? And the answer is we take those activities that we want to do and we make them into habits. And to tell you about how we do this, let me tell you another story. In fact, let me find the, the slide for this because it's kind of interesting. It's a story actually about Starbucks because Starbucks has thought a lot about this question of willpower and habits. Now, everyone, of course, knows what Starbucks is, right? It's a big coffee company. And, and the reason why Starbucks has been so profitable traditionally is not because their coffee is great. It's because of customer service. It's because you know that when you walk in- Can you in, say that again? Can you say that again, please, just for my sure, audience, sure, my company? Absolutely. The reason why Starbucks has been so profitable is not because of their coffee. It's not even that great coffee. It's because of customer service. Perfect. Go and ahead. this is what they focus on 100%. You know that when you walk in, there's going to be this soft music playing and like wood paneling. There's going to be some young barista who takes your name and writes it in big cursive letters. On Here, the here's the money. Here, exactly, plenty of money. Exactly. It's a whole experience. Now, the problem for Starbucks, though, is that the average Starbucks employee is 19 years old. And as we all know, 19 years old, the problem with being 19 years old is that sometimes you act like a 19 year old, right? We're all kind of morons when we're 19 years old. And for Starbucks, this became a particular problem as social media took off. Let me show you how bad it got. She was a loyal customer of Starbucks, loved the coffee, loved the service, but that changed a few weeks ago. This native New Yorker got seen, not though I was inside her cup, but something written on the outside. That's what she called Nina Panetta and ordered a special brew of fully caffeinated Seven on your side. And then when you looked at it, what did you think? I was shocked. I didn't, I didn't understand why. Why would they do that? Vicky Reveron is talking about this Starbucks cup. On the side, a Starbucks employee wrote what she ordered, a caramel frappuccino. But instead of scrolling her name on the side, she says he wrote the B word. It says Vicky. My name's not Vicky. It's Vicky. Now, if you're Starbucks, right, if you're the guys who run Starbucks, this is like your nightmare come true. This is like, this is like the- If you're the guy who runs Supreme Lending, this is your nightmare come true. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. This is terrible. And of course they do an investigation to figure out what happened. And they find out that Vicky was served by this 19 year old barista. And this kid had never had a problem in the last two years working at Starbucks. Never a discipline problem, nothing going on. But the night before Vicky comes in, this kid gets into a fight with his mom. He ends up sleeping only like two hours that night. He's an hour seven and a half of an eight hour shift. And then Vicky comes in and this kid does this thing that is unforgivable, right? Completely inappropriate. And so Howard Schultz, the CEO of Starbucks, he's looking at this and he realizes this is like a pattern. Same thing happens every time they have some type of huge failure 
it's like some 19 year old who hasn't had any problems. And then they're like exhausted because they, they're in a fight with their boyfriend or girlfriend or there's tension and drama with their manager. Something happens that weakens their willpower muscle and a customer comes in and they do something stupid. So Howard Schultz says, look, what I got to do is I got to teach these kids to have more willpower, right? I got to teach them how to make it through a six hour or eight hour, hour shift, even after having a fight without having a total meltdown, without doing something dumb. So he goes and he finds habit researchers, some of the top habit researchers on earth. And there's actually this famous experiment in, in looking at willpower studies. It's called the marshmallow experiment. The way it works is this. There was this researcher at Stanford who had a four-year-old kid and he takes his kid and a bunch of her classmates into a room one by one and he puts a marshmallow in front of them. And he says, look, I'm going to leave the room, but if you if you want, you can eat the marshmallow. If, however, if when I come back, the marshmallow is still there, then I will give you a second marshmallow. Now they've repeated this experiment a couple of times. Let me show you what happens when you put a marshmallow in front of a four-year-old. I'm going to do something, something and I'll come, come back. back. It's not yummy. Oh, it's so really So only one of those kids managed to go the whole 10 minutes and get the second marshmallow. Let me show you which one it was. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? You won it. Yeah. So that's how you have to give me another one. I need both. It's great. It's great. Exactly what my kid would do. So, so Howard, so Howard Schultz, he 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 hires all these marshmallow researchers that have looked at stuff like the or these habit researchers who have looked at stuff like the marshmallow test. And what he learns is that the guy who did this experiment, he found that about forty percent of the the four year olds could resist the marshmallow. And then this researcher, his name is Walter Michelle, he ends up tracking down these kids later. He tracks them down in middle school and in high school and college after they graduated from college, and he finds that the kids who could resist the marshmallow. At every stage of life, they do better than their peers. They get better grades because they turn their homework in on time. They have more friends in high school, not because they're like prettier or better at sports. They're just better at being friends. They get into better colleges. They get higher paying jobs. They get married earlier and stay married longer than, than their peers. What they realize is that this thing, willpower, it is like a magic skill, right? It's something that improves people's lives. But they also realize you can teach people willpower. And the way that you teach people willpower is you train them how to make it into a habit. So Howard Schultz, the CEO of Starbucks, he hires a bunch of these folks and they rewrite all their training manuals for employees so that you learn 30 new habits as soon as you start working. One of my favorites is this thing called the latte habit. On your first week of work at Starbucks, your manager sits you down and they say, look, I'm going to teach you the latte habit. If an angry customer comes in, if someone's doing something, they're upset, what you should do is latte them, which means listen to their complaint, acknowledge their complaint, thank them for complaining, take care of their complaint by giving them like a free cup of coffee or anything else they want, and then explain why this will never happen again. And your reward will be that the customer's happy. So they roll out this training and then they do a survey to figure out if it's working. They find customer satisfaction scores have gone up. Now employees don't freak out. They know what to do. Instead of writing a bad word on someone's cup, they latte them. But more importantly, they find that, that employee satisfaction scores have gone up. And they start asking the employees, well, why are you guys so happy all of a sudden? And they say, oh, man, we love the latte habit. Like, I latteed my mom last night. I latteed my ah. girlfriend. <laughs> well, now they, now they know how to solve exactly. a problem. Exactly. What Starbucks is actually teaching them is they're teaching them life skills. 
They're teaching them how to make the world better. And this is kind of the point of the books, right? Is to try and teach you how to take this information, how to take what we know about habits and make it into something that you can use in your own life. Because you cannot white knuckle your way through everything. You can't white knuckle your way through exercise. You'll exercise a couple of times. You might give up cigarettes for a week or two. And then, you know, your mother-in-law comes into town. Your kids are having a bad day. Something happens that's stressful. And you say, like, I'm not going to go run today. Man, I really need a cigarette. I'm not going to eat the marshmallow. I'm not going to eat the mar- I'm not going to write about my mother-in-law on a cup. What exactly. I'm going to do is <laughs> I'm going to do the latte. <laughs> you need something else, right? You need a new habit to take over for you. Yeah. So then instead of saying, what do I fill this vacuum with? You say, no, I got latte or I got, I got a, I know what my morning routine is, man. I get up and I see those shoes next to my bed and I know I'm going to have a nice shower and smoothie afterwards. Awesome. So how long does it take to break a habit after we've watched film of our life and we go, you know, or I already just know I need to change this. How long does it take to break and then to build a new habit? It differs from habit to habit, right? Like if you want to start um, eating chocolate on a regular basis, you can probably do that in about 30 or 40 minutes, right? That's a habit. It's pretty easy. If you want to start exercising, it's going to take a little bit longer. But here's the thing that's important to know. And the thing that's really empowering is that Every single time you do that habit, every single time you put that cue, that routine, and that reward together, it's going to get a little bit easier. Now, you might not even notice at first that it's getting easier, but your brain is noticing. Your brain is making going for a jog easier. Your brain is making having a salad instead of a sandwich easier. And every single time it gets easier, your brain is getting into that loop. And eventually, after a week or two or three, you're going to wake up one morning and you're going to think like, okay, I got to go for a, for a run. And you're suddenly going to realize it wasn't hard to go for a run at all. Like this is just, this is just what I automatically do. And so maybe, maybe it takes three weeks. Maybe it takes four weeks. Maybe it takes two weeks. It differs from person to person and habit to habit. But every time you do it, it's going to get easier. And eventually it's going to feel totally natural and automatic. You know, it it feels like in almost most of the cases, a a bad habit or something else good for us, there's short-term pleasure in it, right? A short-term... And then, but the best thing to do, the better habit, the pleasure's not short-term exercising, a great example. Um, I I go home today and I'll stare at my Peloton and I'll probably call my Peloton what they wrote on the Starbucks. uh, uh, Me and my wife both do. Um, But then when you get off of it, you know, at the end of it, you feel, I feel so much better, but nothing's really changed in that minute, but I know over time, something will change. Is that right? I mean, is it just changing? So, so one of the ways to think about it is that our brain tends to move from external rewards to internal rewards. So the first couple of times you used that Peloton, if you're not someone who exercises regularly, you do need an external reward. You need a piece of chocolate or you need your wife telling you good job, honey. Or you need your trainer saying you did fantastic, or you need to go to your calendar and check off. I exercised today. You need an external reward. But over time, your brain starts to learn, you know what? When I exercise, I feel great afterwards, right? It's those endorphins, it's those endocannabinoids in my brain. They're getting released by exercise. And your brain starts to recognize there's an internal reward that's even more powerful than the external reward. And once it makes that realization, that is when all of a sudden you don't need that chocolate. You don't need that praise anymore. Because you've learned what reward it provides for you. You know, I think that's a great, great idea point that you just made. Because if you have people in your life, we do small group in our company with others. And we share our goals or our new habits that we want to create that are better habits in our lives with those other folks. When people are encouraging you, giving you feedback, inspiration, otherwise, that serves as that short-term pleasure that a bad habit may be eating the wrong foods, but it tastes really good right now. Maybe not exercising, but feels better just to sit on the couch. But when we, when we start down that road, having somebody in your life to give you that, um, including yourself, like eat a piece of chocolate, reward yourself for making change. Right. So or even just really, in, 
No, that that community is really important. In fact, you know, if anyone who's watching, if you've struggled with alcohol yourself or you have a a family member who's struggled and you've ever been to a 12 step program or heard them tell talk about a 12 step program. What's the most important part of that? You go to a group. You go sit with other people who are struggling with the same thing. And when you say it has been a month since I had my last drink, everyone applauds for you. When you say it's been two days since I had my last drink, one day they applaud for you. Because by having a community around us, we get not only that reward, but we get reminded that it's possible, right? We look around and we say to ourselves, you know, Jim over there, Jim's got a terrible life. And that guy's been sober for 12 years. And if Jim can do it, I can definitely do it. And it's really important to have that around you. You know, um, mostly what I experience when people that are, um, that when we all experience other people that have dangerous habits, drugs, they eating has gotten to the point where they're, they're unhealthy because they're so um, big or they drink or drive or they're drinking too much when they have a dangerous habit. Most people, you know, relation, family relation, they judge them. Um, and they don't understand what we're talking about, that these habits start and then in some cases they snowball and turn into really dangerous things. We um, have a full time retainer with uh, Dr. Andy Ward in our organization here where we offer anyone without any kind of intervention. Hey, look, if you have any of these issues, please talk to Dr. Ward and he will route you to the right help that you need because we don't want to judge on you. We want to love on you enough to be able yeah. to invite you to find an environment that can help you change your habits that are potentially really dangerous. So I would just encourage our audience today not to judge on people that have issues and not avoid it. If you love somebody, you know, invite yourself in to tell them I love you enough to tell you, I think maybe you need some help with some of the habits that are in your life. I've got a last question for you, Charles. And by the way, uh, thank you so much for not only being here today, but thank you for writing on, on this topic. Obviously, you're your Yale background, your Harvard background, your experiences. You could have written on any topic. Um, and I love your, your second book, Smarter Faster. I've, in fact, got from one of my very close friends who's brilliant, told me just recently that, that, that we ought, ought to read that book. But, but thank you for writing on this topic because it is simple, but it's brilliant. Um, and and I'm glad that you were here today to be able to offer, but I have one last question for you before we sure. part ways in 2022. What's like the one big habit change that Charles Duhigg is focused on this year, or should we ask your wife? <laughs> well, first of all, thank you so much for your kind words. It is such a pleasure to be here with you. It's such a pleasure to, to get a chance to visit with, with your company and your employees. And if anyone has any questions, I hope you'll reach out. You can Google me and find my email address online. And, and I respond to every single email I get from, awesome. from a reader or someone with a question. So what's the big habit for me? So, you know, over the last couple of years, the pandemic, I think, has been tough for us all, right? And and actually, my habits changed a lot during the pandemic. I I uh and I think in good ways, you know, it's a tragic, it's a tragic event, but in some ways it gave us a lot of freedom to spend more time with our family. Yeah. I'm traveling a lot less and I'm discovering I'm so much happier when I'm not getting on airplanes. It's, I think a really, in some ways healthy to, to have this change, even though it comes at such a, an awful cost. But one of the things that I've found is, you know, my, I used to exercise and my exercise was kind of sporadic. Like, I'd get busy and, and like suddenly I would stop thinking about my cues and my routines and I'd stop running. And so one of the things I did this year and last year is I started signing up for half marathons because if I have that half marathon on the, on the calendar, it is so like terrifying to think about running a half marathon without doing training that like, I'm like, okay, I just got to train for it. Like, like the reward is that I'm not going to like be in misery when I'm running this half marathon. And so now, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing one in Nashville in a couple of weeks. I did one in San Francisco uh, a couple of months ago. So now that I've got these races that are on the calendar, it really helps me like, it helps make that training so much more rewarding. Cause I'm like, you know, I'm working towards something and I think it's going to pay off. And so that's awesome. That's well, I think what I'm going to do is get with our marketing team and I'm going to send you um, a life size jar of Hershey Kisses. <laughs> so you can have one piece of chocolate every time you get out and do a run that's preparing you for your half marathon. Mine is 
Mine is that I've told the folks in the organization, I have an affinity for red wine and I function extraordinarily well in life and my life is really well balanced and great relationship at home and taking care of my health. Um, but I could stand to drink less this year. And um, I committed, you know, to my audience, all the folks that are at the organization of my small group, that I'm only going to drink on the weekends. Um, and so far this year, uh, it's been great. I really has. And what I found is that giving up something that was a habit that I was in, um, um, that I might even say I enjoy red wines because I love the variety of wines. But but what I found is, is that I'm much sharper uh, in the mornings. And in terms of business, I'm just much sharper. Now, my leadership team would tell you that they prefer me to drink more red wine again <laughs> because <laughs> I, let's just say I have a bit... I have a lot of energy mostly, and now I have more energy. So they're like, oh, my goodness, less of you would be better. But uh, anyway, that's my thing for the year. I hope our audience will be honest with themselves as a result of today's exchange. I hope you'll, you'll evaluate your life in terms of habits, and I hope you'll identify one, two, three things and edit those, those behaviors so that you too can become your personal and professional best, which is what it's all about. Charles, we're going to have you back uh, to go through your other book, Love which it. I have had just great feedback about. Um, we'll have you back sometime in the near future, but God bless you. And thank you for being our guest on Personal and Professional Best. Thank you, Pat. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you. Have a great year. Thank you, Charles, for offering your insights, expertise regarding the power of habits in our lives. Here's the truth. Every one of us is habitual. Day in and day out, much of our lives are governed by our habits. Are we mindless robots not even aware of what we're doing? Absolutely not. However, if we're really thinking about every one of our choices in life, all of our minds would be overworked. So we tend to run our lives on autopilot. Our repeated choices become habits and we don't even have to think about them anymore. It's the habit cycle of cue, behavior, and reward repeated over and over again. This year at Supreme Lending Southeast, we set a goal to build a championship season at home, in the workplace, everywhere with everyone. The first step towards creating a championship season was to choose to become a champion. Next, you have to set tangible, specific goals, the preferred destination for each area of your life. Then we created individual plans to get there, roads to best. And finally, we all got moving. By February 1st, the vast majority of Americans have abandoned their resolutions and their goals. Why? Well, their plans to reach their goals ran into a brick wall, the unhelpful habits that all of us have formed. Chances are, many of your goals have already encountered the obstacles of your daily habits as well. Hopefully, today gave you some fresh insights into how habits work. I also hope that, like me, you've thought about some of the unhelpful habits that are a part of your life. Now the hard part, how do we edit our behavior? How do we replace our bad habits with better habits. Well, Charles, an expert, he offered some simple and brilliant clues. First, most unhelpful habits, they bring immediate short-term rewards, but bad long-term consequences. Think about it, smoking, drinking, junk food, binge watching television. Healthier choices, usually healthier habits, involve short-term sacrifice, but bring long-term benefits. A salad instead of a burger. Exercise instead of television consumption. You get the idea. Do you feel the positive rewards immediately? Definitely not, but over time your life is so much better. Second, habits are not formed in a day. Research varies on this topic, but habits can take anywhere from 14 days to 90 days to form. And good habits they're especially easy to abandon. So let's connect these ideas. Charles recommended giving yourself a short-term reward 
for your new beneficial behavior until it becomes habitual. Listen, the idea of a piece of chocolate after a workout seems counterproductive, but if it gets you through this season of transition to forming a new positive habit, it's worth giving a try. Eventually, you'll get to the place where you feel incredible after a workout and it brings its own reward without the chocolate. When eating healthy becomes your new habit, you'll actually prefer healthy food to junk food. So give yourself grace and patience as you build new habits. Also, look for ways to hack your own life by combining behaviors and rewards. For example, if you give yourself the reward of companionship and conversation by walking with your partner together after dinner, you can either do that or waste another hour staring at your phone screen. You'll multiply, you can. Positive benefits if you'll find healthy habits in every area of your life. Next month, we'll be diving into one of my favorite, make that least favorite topics, complaining. John Gordon, who taught us all about energy vampires from his book, The Energy Bus, will be joining us again to discuss the catastrophic, and I mean catastrophic, impact of complaining from his book, The No Complaining Rule, Positive Ways to Deal with Negativity at Work. If habits are the fuel that powers drive to our destination best, complaining is a traffic jam along the way that you'll need to find a way to bypass if you truly want to become a champion. Complaining truly is the arch enemy of best. Thank you for joining us today, and I look forward to seeing you next month as we gain new insights from John Gordon. Best is waiting. Meet you there.